Today is uh, the Saturday of Passion Week, the first week of the Passion. You can say, of course, during Lent there's a special Mass for each day, and this day, the Passion Week, the Mass of the Saturday and Passion Week, taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. A lesson from Jeremiah the prophet. In those days the wicked Jews said one to another, Come, and let us invent devices against the just. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, and let us strike him with the tongue, and let us give no heed to all his words. Give heed to me, O Lord, and hear the voice of my adversaries. Shall evil be rendered for good, because they have digged a pit for my soul? Remember that I have stood in thy sight to speak good for them and to turn away thy indignation from them. Therefore, deliver up their children to famine. Bring them into the hands of the sword. Let their wives be bereaved of children and widows and let their husbands be slain by death. Let their young men be stabbed with the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard out of their houses for thou shalt bring the robber upon them. Suddenly, because they have digged a pit to take me, and have laid snares for my feet. But thou, O Lord, knowest all their counsel against me unto death. Forgive not their iniquity. Let not their sin be blotted out from thy sight. Let them be overthrown before thy eyes. In the time of thy wrath do thou destroy them. And then the gospel. Take that according to St. John, chapter 12. At that time, the chief priests thought to kill Lazarus also, because many of the Jews, by reason of him, went away and believed in Jesus. And on the next day, a great multitude that was come to the festival day, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young ass, and sat upon it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Sion, behold thy king cometh sitting upon an ass's colt. These things his disciples did not know at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him. That they had, and that they had done these things to him. The multitude therefore gave testimony, which was with him, which which he called when he called Lazarus out of the grave, and raised him from the dead. For which reason also the people came to meet him, because they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, "Do you see that we prevail nothing? Behold, the whole world has gone after him." Now there were certain Gentiles among them who came up to adore on the festival day. These therefore came to Philip who was of Bethsaida of Galilee and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. Again Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Amen, amen, I say unto you, Unless the grain of wheat falling into the ground die, it remaineth itself alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world keepeth it unto eternal life. If any man minister to me, let him follow me. And where I am, there also shall my minister be. If any man minister to me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came into this hour. Father, glorify thy name. A voice therefore came from heaven. I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. The multitude therefore that stood and heard, the, heard said it, that it thundered. Others said, An angel spoke to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. 
And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all things to myself. Now this he said, signifying what death he should die. The multitude answered to him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus therefore said to them, Yet a little while the light is among you. Walk whilst you have the light, and that the darkness overtake you not. And he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Whilst you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things you just spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Today is Saturday, tomorrow Palm Sunday. But tomorrow on Palm Sunday, while we will carry the palms in the beginning of the sacred liturgy of tomorrow. The focus of Palm Sunday will be on the passion of our Lord and the crucifixion. And the church does this for a very practical reason, and that is that many people will not go to Mass on Holy Thursday. Many people will not go to the, the sacred services of Good Friday. And the most important day of the year is Good Friday. And so the church focuses on Good Friday on Palm Sunday. And therefore today, which is Saturday, the focus is on Palm Sunday. So today is a day in which we actually consider the great mystery of that day. And what was inside the mind and heart of our Lord Jesus Christ when He entered the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? It was the beginning of the holiest week of the year. He was going to transform Sunday. Remember that Palm Sunday, one thing to note about Palm Sunday, is it was the last day in which Sunday would be a work day. Eight days later, he would rise from the dead. Eight days later, he would complete his victory. And therefore, for our Lord Jesus Christ, when it struck midnight on Palm Sunday, he knew, this is my last week. This is the last week of the Old Testament. This is the last week. We are going to the final hour, and this is the week that I go to battle. This is the week that I go to war. This is the week that I have been waiting for for 4,004 years. 4,004 years since the creation of Adam and his sin. God the Son had been waiting for this week. There was a conversation in heaven. And the conversation in heaven is, is repeated to us through the type of Isaiah the prophet. When Isaiah was a little boy, and he heard a conversation in heaven, and he heard that man was there was a need for a prophet, he said, Behold, Israel needs a prophet, but there is no prophet. And the little boy, Isaiah, he heard there was no prophet, and he said, Behold, here I am, send me. I will be a prophet. If there is no prophet, though I am a little boy, I will be a prophet. And God said to Isaiah, You don't want to be a prophet. Because if you are a prophet, you will be suffering, you will die. And Isaiah repeated, Behold, here I am, send me. He heard the conversation in heaven. We repeat this conversation with the fathers of the church in Holy Week. That this is the week that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, heard the conversation of the Father and the Holy Ghost, discussing how man had turned away from, from God. And man was deserving of punishment. And God the Father in His anger wanted to destroy man, which He did the first time in the flood. And this was very important that there happened a flood so that man might understand the seriousness of the anger of God over our sins. But our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, says, Behold, here I am, send me. I will come to the earth. And I will die and receive all the wrath of the divine justice of my Father. And no one knows the wrath of the Father better than the Son. And remember this concerning the wrath of the Father. The devil is likened unto a woman. God is like a man. The devil is likened unto a woman. And when a woman is angry and a woman is bitter, a woman is a violence about her, but it is a very dark and malicious violence that is in the woman. 
But when the man stands up in anger, his anger is more powerful. And so likewise, when we see the anger of the devil and the hatred of the devil, it is a very terrible thing. But when God lifts His finger in anger, when He lifts His smallest finger in anger, the devil and all of hell trembles. And he crushes that which is wicked. His justice breathes fire into hell. And he is an angry God. Our God that is infinitely merciful, he is infinitely just. He who infinitely forgives also infinitely condemns. And the devil can be infinite in neither thing. He is a wimp on both sides. He is weak in his positive parts. He is weak in his negative parts. The devil is nothing. But when the wrath of God speaks out, it crushes. We consider the wrath of God in the epistle. Jeremiah. Jeremiah talks about the prayer. The prayer of Jeremiah the prophet. When he says, Lord, do not forgive. And Jeremiah knows that there are two sides of God. There is a side by which he forgives those who repent. And there is a side in which he will never forgive. And he says, Do not thou, O Lord, forgive them. Several times Jeremiah speaks of this, and the sacred scripture reminds us, and the fathers of the church remind us, he is speaking here of the damned. And the majority of souls are damned. The majority of souls turn away from God. And the majority of souls reject his mercy. Even though up until the moment of death he gives his divine mercy, the day comes. And the day will come. And as our Lord said, you know not the day nor the hour. You don't know the day or the hour. But the day will come when the wrath of God climbs. And the wrath of God throws down. So many mysterious things that cannot be considered in this lifetime. And so many beautiful things and powerful things happened on Palm Sunday. Our Lord Jesus Christ was walking over the Mount of Olives. And he knew that in a few days he would be shedding blood in that mountain. And he walked over the Mount of Olives in the very beginning of the day. Jesus Christ is on top of the mountain. And he sees the city of Jerusalem. And St. John tells us, Tomorrow we'll read the St. Matthew's version of Palm Sunday. But St. John always gives a more divine and a more supernatural look at all the things that happened in the life of Christ. His gospel is called the divine gospel. It is a gospel that looks in the most special way at the divinity of Christ. What was in the divine mind? What was in the divine heart? And here we see on Palm Sunday, our Lord Jesus Christ ways. And our Lord Jesus Christ's thoughts are not the ways and not the thoughts of men. He is on top of that mountain. Now on the bottom of the mountain, just a few days earlier, remember that our Lord Jesus Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus has been dead four days. And it was a great miracle. And Lazarus was raised from the dead. And remember, Lazarus was a very famous man because he was a multi-multi-millionaire. And the people loved Christ because whenever, whenever a rich man is saved, well, he used to help. He, Lazarus was a great friend of Christ. Lazarus was a multimillionaire, the richest man in Jerusalem. And Lazarus died. He was dead four days. And Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. And the people believed in him. And all of Jerusalem gathered round. Our Lord Jesus Christ had entered Jerusalem many times. Why was there such a large crowd on what we would call a Monday morning, the first day of the work week, Gathered. Why were they gathered? Why did they say Hosanna to the Son of David? Why did they throw palms before his feet? Because he raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised the rich man from the dead. Remember that one of the lines of the, uh, the little story, the fiddler on the roof. One of the, one of the man says, Well, you know, if the rich man, rich men have to die too. And if only, if only the rich could pay us the poor to die for them, we would all make a life living. And so everyone is interested in rising from the dead, but especially the rich man. Not only is the rich man interested, but even the poor. Wow. Lazarus was rich. Lazarus fed dinners to Christ. 
Lazarus is a significant man. Lazarus was risen from the dead. Lazarus was from the dead. People came to see Lazarus because they all knew Lazarus. They all went to the funeral. They all knew he was dead four days. And they loved Jesus Christ. And they couldn't wait to see him. The city was happy. And the city was filled with joy. And the city was eager because there were boys and spies that went up on the hill and said, Behold, Jesus Christ, he's coming to Jerusalem. But what was in the heart of Christ? When he got to the top of that hill and the eager city was waiting and they all believed in him, he wept. It tells us the Gospel of St. Matthew, and Jesus wept one of only two times that he would weep at the tomb of Lazarus and then here when he was at the top of that mountain, he wept. And St. Matthew tells us what he said. He looked down, weeping upon Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that was waiting for him, the Jerusalem that was going to say, Hosanna to the Son of David. This is the Jerusalem he wept over. And he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou who hast killed the prophets. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou who hast killed the prophets, thou who hast turned away so many, how many times have I have gathered you in my arms? How many times have I gathered you under my wing like a, like, a, like a mother hen wants to gather her chicks? But thou wouldest not. Our Lord Jesus Christ is not happy on Palm Sunday. The people are happy, and He is not. They want to make Him king. They want to adore Him as God. They want to accept Him as the Messiah, and He is not interested why is he not interested? Because they have not changed their hearts. They have not changed their minds. They have not changed their spirits. They want Jesus Christ to be a Christ of the world. And he is not going to be that kind of Christ. Therefore he's weeping on the top of the mountain. And what is inside of the heart? He's praying. And he is praying the prayer of Jeremiah that we read about in the epistle today. He says, Therefore deliver up their children to famine. Bring them into the hands of the sword. Let their wives be bereaved of children and widows. Let their husbands be slain by death. Let their young men be stabbed with a sword in battle. Let a cry be heard out of their houses, for thou shalt bring the robber upon them suddenly, because they have digged a pit to take me, and have hid snares for my feet. But thou, O Lord, knowest their counsel against me, and unto death. Forgive not their iniquity. The same Christ that will say, Forgive them, for they know not what they do on Good Friday. On Palm Sunday, inside of his heart, he says, Forgive them not. Forgive them not for their iniquity. Let not their sin be blotted out from thy sight. Let them be overthrown before thy eyes. And in the time of thy wrath, do thou destroy them. He is an angry God. They would not receive him. And his apostles are surprised that have the weeping of Christ. He enters down in Jerusalem and they receive him with glory. And what does Jesus Christ speak about? First he tells the Pharisees and the Sadducees that there is a fulfillment of the prophecy. They said, how can you let these children praise you? Listen to them. They're saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, if these children did not praise me, the very rocks would cry out. He doesn't accept their praise. And yet he demands their praise. Because Jesus Christ must be praised in public. Our Lord Jesus Christ demands public praise. He demands to be praised in the town square. He demands to be praised by kings. He demands to be praised by nations. And this is very important for us to understand. Modern man says our Lord Jesus Christ is only to be praised in our hearts, in our little churches, in private. But not in the public square. The Jews said that. Look at these children. They're saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. How can you allow that? And he says, if these children did not praise me, the very rocks would cry out. And remember, on Good Friday, the children did not praise him. 
On Good Friday he was not praised, and the rocks did cry out. At the moment of his death, the rocks cried out. Whatever Jesus Christ says is true. It all comes true. Heaven and earth may pass away, but not one jot or tittle of my word shall pass. And he said the rocks would cry out, and they did. On Good Friday, the rocks cry out, and there was a great earthquake, and there was an opening of graves, and men who were dead came out of the graves, and they praised Christ, and they appeared to many on Good Friday at 3 p.m. Before that time, it was a time for living men to praise, and they did not praise, but he must be praised. Therefore, the rocks cried out. On Good Friday, the children praised. Now the majority of those that praise, our Lord Jesus Christ does not accept their prayer because they have not changed their minds and hearts. And yet there are some, and only God knows who they are. There are some, particularly the children, that is those that are innocent. But only God knows who is innocent. And these, he heard their prayer. But he went into Jerusalem on an ass. Fear not Jerusalem, because the king comes in on an ass. Why does he come in on an ass? Because he wants to be close to us, he comes in as a king, sitting. But he does not come in as a king that is so distant from the people that he cannot be approached. He is a king that wants to be close to his subjects, and he wants his subjects to be close to him. His heart is filled with turmoil. His heart is upset. And he speaks about it in the Gospel. St. John noted how upset our Lord was on Palm Sunday. He must have been so surprised. He could not understand. And he even himself says they did not understand what was happening. But they remembered afterwards. They were in a state of confusion. And he had a troubled heart. And then our Lord Jesus Christ makes the prophecy of his own crucifixion. He says, if I be lifted up. I will draw all things to myself. And they are scandalized. Lifting up is an expression used by the Jews to refer to crucifixion. Because when a man is crucified, he's lifted up onto the wood above everyone. And so they used to say, oh, this man was a murderer. He was lifted up last week. This man was caught for a thievery. He was lifted up last week. Lifted up was an expression that referred specifically to crucifixion. As St. John points out in the Gospel. And when our Lord said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all things to myself, they were scandalized. They said, what kind of Messiah are you? How dare you be lifted up? They were scandalized. And he said, and if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all things to myself. Now he said this, signifying the death that he should die. And the multitude answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. How sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? What kind of Son of Man is this? Jesus Christ, the Messiah, must live forever. The law says He must live forever. And you say you're going to die? You say not only you're going to die, you're going to die by crucifixion? What kind of Christ is this? And they mock the Christ that goes to war. When we look in the mystical sense, in the spiritual sense of this battle, this deep supernatural battle in which Jesus Christ is facing the enemy. He is facing the Caiaphas. He's facing the Sadducees. He's facing the Jews. And he's telling them what the battle is all about. The battle is about Good Friday. The battle is about the crucifixion. The battle is about myself being glorified, says the Lord Jesus Christ. I shall be glorified. When you're glorified, you're lifted up on a throne. But he is going to be glorified by being lifted up upon a cross. If I be lifted up, I will draw all things to myself. I shall be glorified. But they're going to prevent his glory. They want him dead. And they are scandalized. And they say to the people, what kind of Messiah are you? How dare you be a Messiah that's going to die? Because our God cannot die. And he scandalizes the people. Our Jesus Christ does never behave very well when he's being praised by false voices. Remember on another day, they wanted to make him king because he had made bread. He had multiplied bread. It's also in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6. They were so happy because he had made so much bread and they wanted to make him king. And he says, you are happy because of the bread. 
You are not happy because you adore me. You are not happy because you believe my word. You are not happy because you are going to change and follow me wherever I lead. You are not accepting me as a true king. Because if you accept me as a true king, you would follow wherever I lead. And I lead to the cross. They are scandalized. They wanted to make him king. He fled into the mountain himself alone. He left them all after scandalizing them by saying foolish words, words offensive to them. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. Are you a cannibal? Yes. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. We don't care about bread. I didn't come here to make biscuits. I did not come from heaven to make biscuits. I did not come from heaven to make money. I did not come from heaven to make you happy in the way you want to be happy. I came here to make a kingdom. And I came here to make this kingdom permanent. And I came here to conquer the prince of this world because I'm a warrior king. That is why I love David, not Solomon. Because David was a warrior and Solomon was a man of peace. And our Lord Jesus Christ loves the warrior because that's what he is. But the world wants peace. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, they will say at the end of the world, peace, peace, peace. But there is no peace. The battle of three and a half years between our Lord Jesus Christ and Caiaphas, between our Lord Jesus Christ and Annas, between our Lord Jesus Christ and the Jews, it's coming to its peak. And the battle between Satan and the Catholic Church is coming to its peak. The same battle that happened in our Holy Church or in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ happens in the church. It happens in the mystical body. And our Lord warns them, while you have the light, walk in the way of the light. Why does He say that? You should read the book of Maccabees. The death of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes he is a type of the Antichrist. And read about his death. Antiochus built the false statue in the temple. He created the abomination of desolation in the holy place. He destroyed the temple. He had, he had the real priests, not false priests. He made real priests, true priests, offer the false sacrifice. The other Kings made false priests offer the false sacrifice. But Antiochus had the real priests, the true Jewish priests, offer the false sacrifice. Just like today, true priests offer the false sacrifice of the new mass, which is an abomination of desolation. So Antiochus did this. Now Antiochus was not killed by the hands of men, but read about his death. <coughs> Antiochus had a great ailment in his stomach. God struck him with a great disease, and he felt so sick and so horrible, and he began to stench. And as he began to feel bad and feel worse and feel worse by the hand of the wrath of God, he began to feel sorry. And you should read the words of Antiochus. He wrote kind words to the Jews, to Jonathan, I believe it was, the one of the, the Maccabees that was still alive, with the five Maccabees, and he wrote to him, it could have been Judas, but I think Judas was already dead. But one of the five Maccabees, he wrote to them, and he said, Behold, I have done wrong. Behold, I am sorry. And if you open up the book of Maccabees to that chapter, you would think they were the words of a saint. And he wept for his sins. And he begged forgiveness. And he promised to be good. And he promised to be good to the Jews. And then he died. And it says in the book of Maccabees, Such is the death of wicked men, for his prayers were not likely to be heard by God. God mocked him in his prayers. He mocked him. And it says in the book of Wisdom, how God shall mock the damned. They will pray. And here is the warning of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know that when the world comes to an end, when the great chastisement comes, when the fire is coming from heaven, when the starvation is coming, when there's no food, when the bad guys are coming and killing not only the good but also the bad, and they're killing everyone, there will be prayers. They will be praying in the streets. They will be begging forgiveness. They'll be pulling out all their old Latin prayers. They're going to say the most sincere and most wonderful prayers, and they will not be heard. 
They will go from their pious prayers and from their sorrow straight to hell. They will not be heard. Let them die in their iniquity. O Lord, hear not their prayers. And he says also later on in the book of Jeremiah, Pray not for this people, for I will not hear thee. In other words, there is a time of grace. There is a time that God gives the grace. And if we reject that time, He may not return. And so, the time of sorrow is coming to our world. There is a chastisement coming upon it. During this chastisement, hundreds of thousands will weep. But very, very few of those tears will reach heaven. Just like our Lord Jesus Christ heard the praises of all these people on Palm Sunday, and when He heard their praises, He wept because He wasn't happy with their praises. And when they talked about making Him king, He said, if I be lifted up, I'm going to be crucified. I'm not here for your little glory. I'm not here to get a trinket. I don't want one of your little gold crowns. My, the gold crown falls off, but my, crane, my crown shall penetrate the skull. The shroud shows us that three of the, the thorns penetrated the skull of Jesus Christ. His crown is stable. His crown is not removable. His crown is the crown of a permanent king. And our Lord Jesus Christ is entering the last week. He goes into the temple and he talks about his crucifixion. And while he's speaking, a voice comes from heaven. And what does the voice say? Now my soul is troubled, our Lord says. He's unhappy on this Palm Sunday. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Because he's angry. He sees the fakeness of these people. Am I going to die for these people? Is this what I came to die for? Some of the fathers of the church tell us that during the agony in the garden, the devil came and tempted Christ. And he said to him, Look what you're dying for. The majority of these people are going to reject you and go to hell anyway. The majority of them are going to spit on your crucifixion. They're going to reject you. Why are you dying for this? Why are you dying for that? Why are you dying for these people? Why are you dying for Sodom? Why are you dying for Gomorrah? And it was a temptation of Christ. And here's an interesting truth concerning the final temptations. As Father Jahir told us in Brazil in the month of January... Martyrs are not made on the day of martyrdom. Martyrs are made before. There are many small tests. And when the real test comes, they pass if they pass the small test. When the real test comes, they fail if they fail the small tests. Martyrs are made before. The Lord Jesus Christ is tempted on Palm Sunday to not go through with the Passion. He doesn't normally speak about what's going on inside of his heart in such a public way. But he says, shall I, shall I go away from this hour? What hour? The hour of my death. The hour of my crucifixion. Shall I go away from this hour? Shall I say to my Father, Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause I came unto this hour. And a voice therefore came from heaven. I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The Father was waiting. Our Lord Jesus Christ could turn away from the hour. He does not. And then heaven comes down and says, For this hour I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again, because it shall be the day of the glory of Jesus Christ. On that day, the apostles were sorrowful, and they were in fear. On that day, the holy men were sorrowful in fear. Only Our Lady had no fear. The rest were afraid and sorrowful, or they were His enemies, or they were disgusted, or they were scandalized. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. And then our Lord Jesus Christ, speaking to the Greek, says, Unless the seed dies, it remaineth itself alone. And he's teaching his apostles. And he talks about the priesthood. And here he tells the priest, What is a priest? My minister. And he says concerning the priest, where I am, there my minister shall also be.
He talks about the battle with the devil. He talks about the priest. Where I am, there my minister also shall be. In any case. The hour has come to send me where men to say to you, Unless the grain of wheat falleth on the ground and it remaineth itself alone, but if I die, I bring forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto everlasting. If any man minister to me, let him follow me. And where I am, there also my minister shall be. And this is the great mystery of the minister of Christ. It is a double mystery. Where I am, there my minister shall be. Where is Jesus Christ? First of all, where is He? He is on the cross. And the minister must also be on the cross. There are many ministers of our Lord Jesus Christ. All priests are ministers of Christ. But we don't like the cross. We don't want to be on the cross. We don't want to experience the cross. But our Lord Jesus Christ, on the day that He ordains us priests, and fills with knowledge of books in the seminary, and afterwards He fills with crosses. Our Lord Jesus Christ wants the minister to be on the cross. He will never allow him to be on the same cross to the same degree that he himself is on the cross. But he wants himself to be on the cross. And furthermore, he says this to the faithful. Wherever I am, there my minister shall be. So if there is a heart that is weeping for its sins, and if there is a heart that wants the mercy of God, the priest will come. Even if there is no way for the priest to come, he will come. Even if there is no way to call the priest, he will come. Wherever the Christ is, there the minister will be. And the flip side is also a mystery. Wherever the minister is, Christ may not be. There are many places where the minister goes, but Christ is not there. But wherever Christ is, there the minister shall be. Many times a priest is brought into a place he didn't plan on going. Many times a priest finds souls that need the priest, but he didn't know that. And there are many times when the priest goes to a place to give Christ to souls, but the souls do not want him. And so where the minister is, Christ may not be there. Maybe the minister is a false minister. Maybe he's a true minister. It is a mystery. And even if he's a true minister, maybe he goes to a place where he is going to be rejected. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ told his apostles, If they reject you and hear not your word, that you repeat from me, then knock the dust off your feet. So many messages from Christ. Forgive all and judge all. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained and sometimes the Pope retains sins. Sometimes the priest retains sins. Sometimes the minister of God retains sins. What did the prophet Elias tell Jezebel? You are going to be eaten by the dogs. And you will not be able to be buried. Did he say to Jezebel, Jezebel, if you only repent. Jezebel, if you're only sorry, God will forgive you. He did not. He said, Jezebel, you shall die in your sin. Jezebel, you shall, be, you shall be eaten by the dogs, and you shall not be buried. And so it happened that she who thought she was beautiful, standing on top of the third or fourth story of a house, and the soldiers came and threw her in the streets, and she died, and the dogs ate her and licked up her blood. It is necessary for the warrior to fight war. There is a time for peace, and there is a time for war. And on Holy Palm Sunday morning, Christ is going to war. He is beginning the Holy Week, the final week of the Old Testament, the final week of His life, the final week in which He is going to go to battle. And He will go into Jerusalem on Sunday, He will go on Monday, He will go on Monday, and on Monday what's going to happen on Monday of Holy Week? He's going to be hungry. And He wants a fig. And he goes to the fig tree, and St. John tells us it was not the season for figs, but it was the season that Jesus Christ was hungry. And if he's hungry, there better be figs. I don't care if it's the season for figs. It's the season that I'm hungry. Notice this about men. They want food when they're hungry, not when it's ready. Our Lord Jesus Christ was a man. He was hungry. 
And he came by the fig tree, and he wanted food. And it was not the season of figs. And he was angry, and he cursed the tree. He came back on Tuesday of Holy Week, the next day, and they walked by the same tree, and it was withered and dead. He was a warrior this week. You will find that Jesus Christ behaves differently during this final week. He is going to the greatest battle. He is going to victory. And the Achaiaphas also, they said, Behold, the whole world is following him. Is there anything we can do? And notice this about some souls. St. John tells us, Lazarus was risen from the dead, and the Jews sought to kill him because so many believed in Christ because of Lazarus. If you believe that you can convert souls by making Christ look good on a nice movie, if you believe you can convert souls by making Christ acceptable to the modern world, you cannot. No matter how many miracles are performed, no matter how many great things that God gives to man, there are daily miracles. Our Lady of Guadalupe's Tilma is a daily miracle. The incorruptibles are daily miracles. The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is a daily miracle. The conversion of souls and the absolution of confession is a daily miracle. Baptisms are daily miracles. There are so many millions of miracles that are happening in the world today. And souls reject Christ anyway. And the day will come when he says enough. One last vision. Mother Mariana of Quito, Ecuador 400 years ago. She saw the Blessed Virgin and she so many, many thousands of times appeared to her holding our Lord in her left hand and on the right there was the three doves. These doves were very sickly. And they looked like they were ready to die. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the baby Jesus, was petting the doves. Trying to caress them. But every time he touched the doves, they turned their heads away. And they were turning themselves away from his touch. And the Blessed Virgin also would try to caress them. And when she would caress them, they also would turn away. And for a very long time, for such an exceeding long time, our Lord Jesus Christ, the baby Jesus, continued to caress and continued to caress and continued to caress. And then, in a moment, in an instant, he shifted. And she saw in the face of Jesus Christ, the baby, an incredible anger. And he stood up on the arm of his mother, and he took the first dove. And he picked up that dove, and he threw it down into the earth. And on the earth it was swallowed. And as it was swallowed down into the earth, not willing to take the bread, Jesus was also trying, Lord Jesus Christ was trying to feed the starving dove a little bit of bread when it would not eat and trying to caress. And then he finally picked up the dove and threw it into the earth and it began to scream and devils came to the earth from the center of the earth and they grabbed the dove and they pulled it down into hell. And then he took the second one and he threw it down and the third one and threw it down in great anger. And the Blessed Virgin explained the vision to Mother Mariana. So these doves are the priests of the church. They are my priests. They are the religious. They are the clergy, particularly of the 20th century. And these souls my son loves, and he tries to feed them with the Holy Eucharist and the sacred bread, but they will not take it. He tries to caress him with his graces and with his divine love. He treats him with so much love and they turn themselves away from it and they grow weaker and they grow weaker and he tries to strengthen them and they reject it. But then one day he will become suddenly angry and he will cost, cast them down. And when they hit the earth because they're so weak and they're so worn out and they don't have any strength in their wings, they cannot fly. And then the devils will come and grab them. And then they will cry. And then they will weep. And crying and weeping, they will go down into hell. Our Lord Jesus Christ is patient. But one day his patience ends. And we must be recognizing that our God is a just God, an infinite God, a good God. But He is a God of power and majesty. And He hears the prayers of His saints. 
And sometimes the saints say, Lord, forgive them, like St. Stephen said. But when Arius was going to the temple of God, to the Holy Church on Easter Sunday, in order to be exonerated from the heresy of Arianism, of which he was the father, and he did not believe in the divinity of Christ, and the church was going to bring him back into the bosom of the church. And he went into the sacristy because Arius was a priest. And he put on, he went to put on his priestly vestments. And he said, I'm not feeling good. I need to go to the restroom. And he went. But there was St. Eusebius in the city of Constantinople. And he said, Lord, do not allow Arius to be exonerated. Lord, do not allow him to have the excommunication lifted upon which he has not repented, from the city has not repented. And the Lord heard the prayer of Eusebius, and when he went in to change just before the Mass, and all the thousands and thousands of people were gathered in Constantinople, and bishops were there, and they were going to lift the excommunication, he felt a great pain in his stomach, and his entrails exploded out on the floor, and he died. Never made it to the ceremony. Also, we have the case of Frere Jesus, I keep forgetting his name, the Mexican the Mexican priest, Mexican brother, who built the Alamo. Fray Antonio de Jesus, I think is his name, but I keep forgetting his name. Great saint of the Southwest. He was to raise so many souls from the dead. And one day, these boys, oh, here comes the saint. Here comes the saint. Here, Johnny, you lay down on the ground and you pretend like you're dead. And we will say... Uh, brother Jesus, our, um, Johnny is dead. Can you raise him from the dead? And they went by, and they said, Our little, our brother is dead. Our brother is dead. And they said, Requiescant in pace. <laughs> May he rest in peace. And walked along. They went to pick him up, and he was dead. On another day, boys mocked Eliseus the prophet. Because Eliseus was bald-headed. And they said, Go up, thou bald head. And they mocked the prophet. And on that day, lions came out from the jungle and ate those boys and killed them. And Eliseus did not save them. On another day, Elias the prophet was sitting on top of a mountain. And soldiers came and said, We demand you, the prophet of God, to come before the king, Achab, because Jezebel demands you to come this day. And he said, Who? What? And fire came from heaven, and thunder came from heaven, or lightning came from heaven, and killed all the soldiers. And the next day a hundred came, and he killed all them. And the third day five hundred came. And when the five hundred soldiers came, the uh, commander of the soldiers said, Elias, don't kill us. <laughs> Please don't kill us. But Achab wants to see you because of Jezebel. Will you please come? And he said, Oh, you only had to ask. And so he came. There are times when God will not demand, will not tolerate mockery. There is a time which is the last time, and only God knows that time. But he is just, and he considers that time in his heart as he's walking down the mountain on, Quinter, on Palm Sunday, or as he's sitting on that ass on Palm Sunday, and the people are throwing palms before his feet. And he says, I am troubled in my soul. I am troubled in my soul. Our Lord Jesus Christ, troubled in his soul as he sits upon the ass. Our Lord Jesus Christ, troubled in his soul as he begins his last week on this earth. Troubled in his soul as he's receiving the false praises of men. Troubled in his soul because here he has performed his greatest miracle, the raising of Lazarus, and yet they do not convert. In fact, they want to kill Lazarus now. There are souls that are so immersed in wickedness that they will not change. And they shall be crushed. And they shall burn. And St. Louis told his soldiers, St. Louis the Ninth, a man of great gentleness, Yes, I want the Muslims to convert. But when you are in battle, run them through. <laughs> and make sure you save your energy. May they die in the first blow, so you don't have to do it twice, because there's more Muslims to kill. <laughs> and so spoke the gentle Louis. And when he was captured by the Muslims, they were so impressed by his holiness, by his greatness, that they released him. But that gentle Lewis was a warrior. He knew how to fight war. And if we are going to follow Jesus Christ, we must be warriors. 
And he was a warrior that came down the mountain on Palm Sunday. It was a warrior that began that week that is called Holy Week. It is a warrior that went to the cross. It is a warrior that conquered Satan. It is a warrior that determined the moment of his hour. It was a warrior that decided to be lifted up upon the cross. The warrior that decided the moment of the death of the devil. The warrior that told his apostles on Holy Thursday night, Confidite, ego vici mundum. Have confidence, I have conquered the world. When he decides to go to battle, Whomever he fights is already defeated. Let us pray that we remain on his side. And the only way to do that is a great love of Mary. The only one who was at the cross without fear. The only one that was at the cross without doubt. The only one that was at the cross and knew what was happening. Was the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that is why she stood at the cross. Because she is the one who crushes the head of the serpent. And if you are sitting, you cannot crush the serpent. <laughs> she was standing. And she will send us to death. If we want to follow Christ, be the child of Mary, she will send us to death. She will send us into the fray. But she'll never leave us abandoned. Because she knows that by the death of the follower of Christ <coughs> comes the conquering of the devil. Comes a great glory. If I be lifted up, I will draw all things to myself, said the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the condition of the victory, and it has never changed. The victory conditions have never changed, and they will never change. If we want to follow Christ, we must follow Him to the cross. We don't follow Him to bread. We don't follow Him to money. We don't follow Him to security. We don't follow Him to golden crowns. We follow Him to the cross. And who does not follow Him to the cross? does not go with Mary because she goes where he is and she will be found with him and whoever is really with her will always be with him the warrior fighting on the cross against sin fighting on the cross to reestablish justice between man and God fighting on the cross for the great love of souls in which there is not much lovable in souls but he fights for the love of souls and he will bring them to God We'll close that. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.